welcome to everybody who joined. Uh, this is the second one we did today. And uh, for my panelists, uh, I don't take great notes, so uh, it's not going to be exact repeat, but I think we have a pretty good sense of, of the format and, and the approach. And and uh, just to maybe set the table, talk about NLP within, broadly speaking, financial services. I think if some of the applications might be a little bit more developed in, in the banking sector and maybe the insurance sector, maybe less so in, in sort of the fundamental analysis shops, but we're going to hear some uh, some feedback that maybe refutes that notion uh, this evening. And, and uh, we talk about uh, data being the new oil. And uh, one of the points we made in the earlier session was if you pick up a 10K or a 10Q and count the actual numbers and leave out the page numbers, but the numbers that have some analytical basis to it versus the words, you get a very different quotient in terms of words versus numbers. So, so we're going to find out how much of this is hype, how much of this is real, and uh, and we certainly want you folks to participate. We had about two dozen questions submitted uh, beforehand, but there's a chat box below, and I encourage you to uh, to join the discussion. So we'll run about thirty minutes and open up for questions. And I said I can I've got some uh, here already on the list, but uh, maybe we will start with uh, introductions. And uh, Julia, I'll turn to you first. Great, thank you, Bill, and thank you for inviting me to the webinar today. It's been great. Um, my name is Julia Bonafetti. Um, I'm co-founder of Rosetta Analytics. Rosetta Analytics is an uh, asset management firm. We use deep reinforcement learning to actually manage our four live investment strategies. Um, we have uh, were founded in 2016, and prior to um, uh, founding uh, Rosetta, um, I was uh, about 25 years at Wilshire, um, the last half as um, president of Wilshire Consulting. Thanks, Julia. Dan? Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Jolzik, CEO of Alexandria Technology. And Alexandria tries to help investors make better decisions by capturing more information, uh, more notably in uh, unstructured content. So we go out and seek um, high quality information sources, uh, some of it faster moving it, some of it slower moving. So things like news, social media, earnings calls, uh, SEC filings, um, and index and classify the information so it can be used in investment processes to capture more information on more names and uh, also on a more timely frequency. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Mershad? Hi, everyone. And uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to the panel, Bill. Um, Mirzad Madavi, I am the Executive Director of Financial Data Professional Institute. We are the institute that um, uh, we have a goal of uh, uh, delivering uh, skills uh, to financial professionals in the area of data science. And uh, I've uh, been in the data science field for most of my career and I've been in multiple industries uh, deploying uh, large scale data science projects. Uh, thanks, Mirzad. So Mirzad, maybe staying with you and uh, we've got various skill sets, backgrounds, experiences, maybe some people deep in data science, maybe some more uh, coming through the Kaya CFA uh, ranks as well. So maybe just to set the table, could you just give us sort of a, a base level definition of maybe just NLP and what alternative data is? Yes. Sure. Um, so let's just start first with NLP. And um, as uh, you mentioned, Bill, um, the uh, uh, proportion of uh, textual data, which we call unstructured data, uh, is 80% of the whole data generated today. So as Bill said, there is, there is a lot more of this kind of information in, in textual format than it is in, in structured data. Uh, natural language processing started in 1950s. And uh, we started with uh, techniques like bag of, bag of words and uh, inverse uh, term frequencies and, and alike. And then it started with automated translation uh, capabilities by computers. Uh, today, natural language processing is a uh, subset of artificial intelligence with uh, uh, intersection with deep learning. 
So Julia mentioned reinforcement, deep learning, for example, that's an area that is used um, uh, heavily in natural language processing or machine learning. And I think Dan mentioned that uh, before as well. So that's the intersection of basically the latest AI and linguistics. In terms of um, uh, alternative data, unstructured data, I think that's where most of the financial sector is focusing on getting either uh, uh, alpha uh, or more likely operational alpha. So it's uh, uh, been a, a, a growing area compared to the traditional fundamental data that we've been working with. Thanks, Prasad. So, uh, so Julia, I think uh, like myself and maybe Dan as well, I think we all had what would be considered maybe more traditional careers at earlier turns in our life and 25 years at Wilshire, I think, leaving as a president. Uh, you're sitting in a very interesting position, and I think maybe your journey from uh, the consultant side to what you're doing now maybe speaks to a question about why now that uh, the words have been out there forever. Uh, data has been out there forever. Uh, I think everything has gone digital, so maybe that's part of the answer. But but if I uh, Google NLP or AI or machine learning phrases you know, or terminologies were coined decades ago, but now we're still talking about it as if it's something new and new in financial services. So what's the catalyst as to why we're talking about this now? Well, I, I think a big part about, uh, of it is um, compute power. Um, we've seen uh, transformational um, changes in terms of chips, Moore's law, um, the ability to um, have server farms in the cloud where you can rent machines and in, in um, different uh, GPUs and CPUs, depending on um, what problem you're trying to solve, uh, it exponentially changes how uh, long it takes to actually solve these problems using the um, algorithms that have been built to um, read the data. And, um, you know, there's been the, you know, back when in the 50s, the mainframes, it would take days, maybe months to actually process that data to actually maybe even identify even a sentence or a word if you thought, and that wasn't even using a neural network. Now it's it's completely changed, although the new generation of models that are using neural networks and uh, with the, uh, as we discussed earlier, to billions and trillions of parameters, uh, they can take long as well, and they're very expensive to generate. And so, um, you know, I think Dan will be able to talk about how you can do this more um, economically and, and at scale to um, get uh, reasonable information out of the data that's being scraped, whatever the source is. Um, and it has a wide array of uses. Uh, and, and I think we're going to get into the buy versus uh, build in a moment. And I want to get both of your views on that as well as Mirzad's. But, but Dan, as, as I think about uh, the use of NLP and, and the use of all data, which I guess maybe I can use them interchangeably because all these words, when you break them down, it is uh, alternative data and every word in a 10Q, 10K, an annual report. This I would assume is not, it doesn't define an investment process. Uh, I, I'm guessing it's gotta be married into a fundamental process. It's not a be all and end all. And, and how does this uh, this new technology uh, marry up against fundamental analysis and how important it is to have both of them as part of an investment process? Yeah, um, I mean, they are complements of each other, right? And so it's when it comes to traditional data sources or fundamental data sources, hard data sources, however you want to call them, right? Like they, uh, other than like price data or volume data, tick data, right? Like the refresh rate tends to be pretty slow, right? Um, uh, you might have estimates that update, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, um, and a lot of things can happen in between um, that aren't captured. So, I mean, one nice benefit of alternative data in general is it's delivered to you at a higher frequency, right? It's not that you have to be a higher frequency trader to use it, but, right, you can use the information to um, improve forecasting going forward. Like one of the examples we've actually used on the macro basis is, you know, you can take a look at, it's almost like now casting. Well, it is 
in some ways now casting, right? Like you can capture from news every company that's laying off employees, right? And so then you can kind of build a framework for, okay, what is this going to mean for the unemployment number that's going to come out on the second or third week of the month, whatever that case may be, right? And if you're seeing all of a sudden an uptick in reports and news wires that people are laying off or more companies are laying off employees, you might then infer, well, you know, I don't know if this is actually being kept captured in hard estimates. I don't know if this is being actually captured in consensus. So, you know, I might actually think that this print is going to be a miss or a larger miss than expected. So given the refresh rate and given that it's not captured in, I think, hard units, um, in some cases it allows you to, um, well, use the information differently, but also incorporate it into your forecasting. Okay. And I should probably know this given the second rodeo today, but does Alexandria Technology, do you uh, gather the data sets and sell it to the asset management industry? Is that broadly speaking the model or is it something different than that? Well, that's phase one, right? Um, I mean, this will go into the bigger build versus buy uh, perspective. But, you know, uh, right now, like, you know, the early adopters have been the quants, right? And one of the things with quants is like, um, you know, they, they like to validate heavily uh, and Julia, you can definitely speak about this more than I can, validate heavily the information inputs, right? So like, you know, we have choices. We can go to someone and say, well, we can classify all the information that you have on hand internally, like on premise. Um, but I think one problem with that, well, we know one problem with that is like, people are gonna pay for things that they don't know have value. So we said, okay, we have to tackle this problem differently. Let's go try to find data sets that we find interesting, textual data sets that we find interesting. Let's index them. Let's, you know, a big requirement in the quantitative industry was having a deep archive, right? Um, so let's start with those uh, and then we can classify and deliver. So, you know, that does add value to the end user in some sense in that we're going out and actually identifying which information sources are valuable. Because I mean, I do have to say like, we actually don't work with everybody. Um, I know that's hard to believe, but it's actually true. Like, so I was a former quant at Bernstein. Um, so we backtest everything. And like our goal is, well, not only to sort of standardize text and make it into more usable form, but like we also want to distill information from noise. And while we're not necessarily right, the end all be all, like we're at least as an early proof point back testing and validating some of these inputs are valuable. And then obviously we hand it not our signals or our research, but we hand over our data to a quant to, you know, uh, apply their own um, quantitative techniques to see if that information, one, has value on a standalone basis, but then two, adds value to their processes. Okay, so so Julie, I think this would be an interesting uh, point to stick with. So so I would assume, is it fair to say a firm like Rosetta, you're the consumer of some of these data sets? And if Rosetta consumes a certain data set produced by Dan's shop, you may or you most likely you're using it very, very differently than another client that might be buying the same data set. That would be correct. So um, you know, the the in the I think where you're leading to is you know, the, one of the arguments against using standardized data sets is, oh, well, you're going to arbitrage whatever signal is away. But, it, and that, uh, I guess in theory that could happen, but in our experience, like our model is proprietary IP that we've built specifically to um, uh, predict um, directionally in some case, but because we're using deep reinforcement learning, we actually size. So we're actually maximizing a log return. And so the inputs into our model are there to uh, trade the portfolio from a, um, a short to medium term focus. And so what we ingest in order to inform the model, and in our case, uh, our two deep reinforcement learning um, uh, strategies, one trades the S&P 500 and the other trades European Union carbon futures. So um, they're from the inputs that best describe those two markets, uh, we're going to use data sets that we think um, can give the model the best uh, opportunity to understand uh, the underlying regime that's currently being traded because you know, neural networks have memories 
and they adapt and learn through the process. And so um, as, as the, the reward is reinforced or the, if, if, it, if the signal is incorrect for a particular time period, that penalty is gonna be reinforced. The data underlying uh, those inputs because we're extracting features rather than handcrafting and, and telling the model that this is what describes the model. We let the model uh, determine the features based on the data. And so it's really important from somebody like Alexandria that we would understand exactly how it's constructed, how, um, you know, the predictive power um, in terms of probably using their advice in terms of the best way to um, construct uh, or ingest those inputs. And, and so I assume by the time you get your hands on this data, theoretically a lot of the noise has been rinsed out and it's signal rich in terms of how you can interpret it or is that not correct well the mo the model is um distilling the data so um that's why there's a and nlp is a um you know is a very distinct um uh approach to gathering information. I mean, there's, you can use geospatial. I think you're using, uh, you said earlier, Dan, you're using speech, you're using uh, different types of unstructured data into our models. Like we, for example, in one of our models, we use auction data that is scraped. And so um, how that, how you um, standardize the inputs so that you know, it's uniform and how it's ingested. That's a little bit different. When, once it's ingested, then the neural network will determine how to dynamically weight the underlying patterns that it's seeing in the data to uh, feed a signal into the reinforcement learning, which is the actual optimization framework that it's using to um, uh, achieve that objective that we've given our model, which is to maximize log return. So I just have uh, one more uh, for you, Dan, and then we'll get Merzad in. Uh, so I want to stay on the signal versus noise, and there's just so much unstructured data in, in words that you could pull in. Uh, and I would assume the obvious might be anything the management says. If it's a press release or an utterance uh, on an earnings call or a 10K or a 10Q, are there other sources you think of beyond that? Uh, and I guess it's, it could be quite broad in that... Uh, uh, you're looking at uh, Fed policy and maybe the bankers in parts of Asia, et cetera. But uh, there's only so much data you can pull in. Uh, how do you prioritize where you want to go shopping for this data? <laughs> That's, yeah. I mean, most of it really does come from, you know, client demand, right? Um, well, the first case was like we started with news in 2012 because like we just thought like everyone's getting news from a Bloomberg terminal or a Dow Jones terminal or a Thomson Reuters terminal that like, you know, they're paying for these things. But like and this is from my experience at Bernstein, right? Like I had a Bloomberg on my machine like we never used it. I used to like, go to my boss and be like, why is this on my machine? Like we don't use this thing at all. We're quants like and we're we're not only not only are we quants, we're like longer term quants. So like, you know, there would have to be something that really, really happens in the newswire for us to like maybe pull a trade or something. And that's going to happen like once, I don't know, once every quarter or maybe once every year. Um, but, you know, it's this kind of this idea like everyone is getting news because it's deemed necessary necessary to have but do people really know if it's necessary to have like or is it just like this idea that it's necessary to have so um you know that became the first place to look um and like we kind of went around and uh, had a dow jones was interested in like working with us and that kind of that's how we started um and then from there right you kind of just get this growing wave of feedback um, of what people really want. And, uh, you know, not surprisingly, earnings calls was a, a was a big one. But I mean, the funny thing was like, uh, there, you know, you talked about build or buy earlier, some people are like, well, we can just do this ourselves with like, um, you know, there's the popular law for McDonald dictionary out of Notre Dame, or, um, you know, let's use BERT. Um, but you do find that these NL these NLP systems actually deliver very different conclusions. Like we've done a paper that we compare our classification to Finbert and Law for McDonald at a sentence level. And out of 62 million classifications, uh, there is a correlation of like 0 0.14 of us to the dictionary and 0 0.17 uh, 
to Finber, and so you're just you're just getting different outcomes um, overall. And you know that's just at the pure classification level. And then when you apply it to you know a prediction level, because that's like the second step. And just one final thought on that, not to consume too much time. Like like we we make a very clear conscious decision of not to deliver like uh, factors or predictors to end users. Like, you know, if anyone is interested in looking at our data sets, it comes with like 20 to 30 features. And it's like the end user can pick and choose which features they want. Like, of course we do some demonstration, but we are very conscious to use very few features just to not make too many assumptions. Um, and that ultimately is kind of like the end user's choice and how to extract that value. Uh, thanks, Dan. So, uh, Prasad, I know uh, at the FDP Institute, which uh, you oversee, uh, and we've got the core curriculum, but we're also working on a series of micro badges. And one of the ones that's uh, sort of right in beta right now is on NLP. And it's interesting, the focus there, and it, it does get to a little bit what uh, Julia and Dan are both uh, trying to do in their day jobs is try to uh, bring more efficiencies to the operating side of the business. And if I think about financial services generally and asset management more specifically, most of the human resource in terms of physical bodies sit in the mid and back office. And the concept of uh, operational alpha spending less to get higher return uh, certainly uh, makes sense too. And it produces a better bottom line, more operating leverage, et cetera. Uh, so I think we're gonna be talking mostly about NLP as it relates to the process, but I didn't wanna leave the operational side out. So maybe a couple of views as to how important that is to make sure that th that part of the business line keeps pace with the geniuses up uh, in the investment process. That's a very good point, Bill. Um... And I've, I've looked at, the, done enough research to look at what's in the front office, what's in the middle and back office. And I could definitely say that the attention uh, to the uh, middle and back office in terms of data science techniques has been lacking. So, and, and that's really where, as you mentioned, most of the uh, population resides and also that's where we find a lot of diversity and the chance for skilling up people. So in terms of the best use cases, what we have done, we have looked at the life of a trade from the beginning, from the front office, all the way to clearing and settlement and, uh, and back to the front office. And what you can find, what you can see is that the role of data science in predicting trade fails is very important. Um, the role of um, all the uh, data science techniques in automation process, what we call intelligent automation to produce uh, more uh, automated workflows is very important. And also NLP gives, us, uh, gives an opportunity to apply to compliance and regulations um, and contracts, things of that nature that uh, consumes a huge amount of work in the middle and back office. And those are not really cheap labor. I mean, you're talking about legal hours in the hundreds and thousands of hours. So I think I think the NLP, especially NLP and, and in general AI, has been lacking in the middle and back office. And now there is an understanding that this thing can really help in operational alpha. And, and I think some of the challenge and maybe the opportunity about uh, the markets being so efficient on the public side, uh, I think a lot of what we're bringing forward this evening is the inefficiencies of all of this old data. And I looked at a sizing recently, it's 80 zettabytes on its way to 175. And if you don't know a zettabyte, it's uh, 10 to the 21st power of a byte. So uh, a big ass number to put it bluntly. <laughs> <laughs> and by uh, virtue of the cell phone, every like, every click, everything is being digitized. I assume even the Bible is for digitized and the 10 commandments and the list yeah. is on. So, uh, so I think there is uh, a lot of uh, opportunity uh, amongst this sea of inefficiency. And I think what we're also trying to do and maybe a little bit of infomercial is that 
the skill set needed in this space, data scientists coming in versus a traditional analyst. There's a lot of white space in terms of uh, how to how these two uh, bodies can work together into in one sort of cogent uh, investment process. So uh, so it's it's a great work that you're doing there, Mazad. Uh, so uh, uh, Julia, this morning uh, we didn't touch ESG to the very end, and I wanted to give that a little bit of airtime here because I think it's an interesting test case maybe specifically for NLP. And, and when I think about the knock on it, well, a couple of things. One is that ESG is not a single risk factor. And I think we talk as if it is. I think the SEC acts as if it is. And there's just so many risk factors focused uh, in there. So maybe I'll just pull one out, which is climate. Uh, and, uh, and maybe that is its own specific risk. It has broad tentacles as well. But uh, but management uh, on an earnings call may be saying all the right things, or maybe they have eloquent prose in the annual report, but do they really mean it? And there's no standard way of disclosing ESG, no standard way of measuring ESG as best as I can tell. And again, it may apply less to Rosetta because as a quant shop, maybe people are just focusing on the alpha and I'll take care of ESG somewhere else. But does that enter into your investment process at all? Well, um, as I said, we're directly trading carbon. So the, the, that's a regulatory market in Europe that's there to offset, um, you know, everyone's carbon footprint. That said, you know, I, I think it, it, it really depends. I guess, I guess the issue I have with the whole ESG framework is there's a little bit, maybe a lot of confirmation bias in it, and if we focus on climate, you know, there, there's a big difference between weather and climate, right? And climate is a really long-term uh, change. Things may be getting hotter, but if you're going to uh, build a model just based on certain things that you see impacting weather, whether you're uh, looking at agriculture, water, um, you know, extreme weather, it, the predicting the outcomes of those, to me, it's a little bit like fundamental research because you really have to be careful about how you frame that problem, right? And you have to make sure that if you're scraping data, that you're scraping the exact right data. So, you know, Dan would, and Dan's firm would really have to help you understand how fluid and the characteristics of that data it, it, to even get close to any sort of prediction. Um, and so, you know, I really, I really think that this is going to be prevalent, but it's, it's evolutionary. And right now the data that's out there, a lot of it is just check the box kind of data, which I don't think is very valuable from uh, an investment standpoint. So there's a lot more work that has to be done, I think, to make it meaningful. Yeah, so Dan, I'd love to get your views on this because if uh, I think if you ask any professional uh, with a microphone or a camera in front of them, do you believe in climate? Do you believe in ESG principles? Yes, yes, yes. But then reality may be something different and you've got to sleuth through maybe unstructured data and NLP to find that out. How prevalent is this either as a, as a source of alpha or measurement tool? Is it something the allocators are looking for uh, when you look at data sets? Well, I think that's, one of the challenges, right? As far as, so, I mean, from at least the inputs that we have at our hands at the moment, right? Like ESG is not a strong alpha factor, right? And that could just very well be because it's just a longer term time horizon, right? And like um, investors and uh, fund managers have to report on, you know, quarterly or monthly quarterly cycles, right? And so, um, you know, what we see a lot of the times are people are prioritizing stronger alpha factors that just are outside of ESG. Um, I think the second challenge when it comes to ESG is, um, well, you've already mentioned this, Bill, like there's just not a standardization of even reporting, right? So not surprisingly, if you look at the trend of uh, particularly environmental comments um, in the last, you know, 16 quarters, the positive statements just keep going up. 
Um, and it's like, okay, well, yeah, you'd sort of expect that. Um, so you kind of, you know, then the question then becomes of how much of this is greenwashing versus how much of this is real. And so if you just took a look at the calls in and of themselves, you're not going to get the right answer. So then, okay, what else do you do? Maybe you go to Newswires um, or look at another information source that um, could help complement that idea. And a lot of the news wires are actually dominated by press releases by the companies themselves. So, okay, just more on the, uh, you know, um, internal company bias reporting um, so far. So, like, what could be another step? Well, I, depending on the type of company, right? Like, you might have to even go to social sources to see if there is anything that could contradict what um, managers are saying. Because right now, managers are saying we love the environment, but what they're actually doing uh, could be very different from that. So um, because it's not such a strong alpha source, it, it makes things a bit, well, at the moment, right? It, it, ma it makes it harder because like, yeah, of course you want to incorporate this, but, you know, if everything that you're hearing and seeing is from management, you know, how much can you really take at face value? Yeah. So, uh, go ahead, Mirza. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe uh, I can interject with, a, with an actual use case if it's of interest. Please. Um, at Deutsche Bank, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to give names, but now I said it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll get bleeped <laughs> later and then the replay. <laughs> so um, this one, this is a real use case example that's been published for using ESG actually. And it's really relevant to the topic of discussion today because it uses NLP and it uses what is called the topic modeling technique. So they went in there and they found identified five topics with keywords. And then instead of taking the rankings, they did take rankings from the ranking agencies, but they did this independently themselves. So they built the topic modeling and they built the uh, subtopics around that model and then ran it through the companies uh, that um, was in their portfolio and that they were supposed to do their due diligence on. And they found out something very interesting, some very interesting stuff. For example, what the report shows that companies that are using highly active and numeric language in their, in their text data have a 74% chance of reducing their future emissions, okay? So some really numeric data came out of that. Or for example, analyzing text data, what they found was that companies that frequently discuss mitigating or adapting to climate change have a 65% higher chance of achieving their goals and uh, uh, their, um, their uh, um, objectives. So these were published and they were using some of the latest NLP techniques. So I would say ESG uh, has some good use cases around it with some good results. And this is typically is one of them. And, and I think ultimately it comes down to, I think it is, uh... As investors, I think all, many of us act more like market participants, and our long term is focused on uh, uh, and, and hours and maybe days. And uh, and I think, as Dan points out, uh, ESG broadly speaking, or climate, uh, is it a risk? Yes, but are you being compensated for avoiding it or managing around it? And uh, and I think the jury is maybe still out. Uh, and I think Dan, you were even a little bit more bold on that. And. Uh, and, it, and it's uh, it's hard to determine whether or not you're truly getting compensated for. And this concept of the double bottom line is still somewhat elusive. Uh, so we're a little bit uh, past uh, the top of the hour. So so maybe uh, move uh, st start to move toward uh, some of the questions that came, uh, in in advance. And then I see one here, uh, Dan. And maybe I'll start with you. And our preface this was something I asked you earlier about. Can management game the system and tonal implications? And and just a, a funny side story. I worked for a, a, a Dutch asset manager for many years who acquired a firm that we started in Boston. And uh, the Dutch are multilingual, and their ex their English is excellent. 
and I never learned a word of Dutch the entire time I worked for them. But the government <laughs> I reported to constantly reminded me of this fact. So anytime I sent them an email, I would Google most underused words in the English language. And I would put <laughs> words in the email and he wouldn't know what it was. And it drove <laughs> So, uh, so the question uh, I hear about uh, can you game the system? And this talks about breaking into a blockchain, which I think is very, very difficult uh, to do on a distributed ledger. But I guess there's ways of doing that. But, but can uh, can you game the system around? Uh, let me just pull this question back up, so I'm not paraphrasing it too much. You might be able to see it yourself. Uh, uh, so in a similar fashion to a hack in blockchain, can data like an earnings transcript be compromised at source? By including certain words or phrases that might be overly positive, and I think we talked a little bit about a question like this this morning. Yeah, I mean, look, the short answer is, of course, it could, but um, you know, it really depends on the type of system you're using, right? So, like, if you're using, I would say, more dictionary or rule-based approaches, then there could be sensitivity to words, right, or particular words that are very strict. And I think that's kind of like what people are prep or IR departments are prepping for, right? Hey, you know, don't use these bad words and try to use these good words overall. But, you know, the more advanced machine learning techniques now don't just look at words or phrases standalone, right? Um, we talked about this earlier, but Bert goes so far as it can even predict what the next sentence might be overall. So it really becomes a combination of features being words or phrases that it's looking for. And even here, sequence matters, right? So, um, you know, you can't just pepper in some good or bad words um, overall to game the system. I think, you, you know, it could slightly influence the system, but, um, you know, as people look and as you're capturing training data and have this kind of uh, uh, validation stage of saying, no, this actually is not a good sentence or this is, you know, not a good paragraph. Um, you know, those words, although they might be considered positive by the um, inputters, end up not being positive um, by the model. So, you know, machine learning is machine learning is just very good at being able to um mitigate or mute uh those words so like one of the things that we look at like when i talk about even differences with other systems like you know we had made sure a lot of what i would call promotional language was treated as neutral right and you get all this language we're the best company in the world well yeah of, yeah great like i don't expect a manager to get on the call and say like this company's terrible and i hate working here so it's like okay like best company that's a neutral statement, right? Or a neutral phrase, let's say. And you know, then there's other statements like, "We our products are the best in the in the industry," and like we, you know, we are doing everything we can to make sure they're the best. Again, um, that is more of a neutral statement than it is a positive statement. I think it actually comes back to Merzad's statement. Like one of the things we really try to key in on are the fundamental statements themselves, and particularly those around numbers, right? It's not that we're just kind of extracting the hard numbers, but we're looking at the, um, like really keying in the text around those numbers. Um, and that I think leads to just better outcomes overall and it's much harder to game. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, Julia, we didn't uh, touch too much on the private markets uh, on this uh, webinar, but uh, I assume that Rosetta probably travels more in the public space, but. Uh, but you once worked for a firm that had an index with 5,000 names in it uh, at Wilshire and uh, no longer the case and, and more value creation is happening in the private markets. And I think maybe a challenge for unstructured data and NLP specifically is that uh, if management's talking less, they don't have to produce quarterly reports, uh, they don't have the press calling them, they've got a concentrated shareholder base, it's a lot harder to get your arms wrapped around uh, what's going on on the private side. Perhaps you haven't encountered that, but as a, as a practicing professional for a relatively long period of time, any views on, on how we're going to crack the code uh, at NLP in, in the private markets? Well, you know, I think in terms of due diligence uh, for uh, portfolio companies, you know, there's probably definitely a, uh, and, and I'm sure it's being used, uh, to scrape data off of different channels. Uh, I mean, think about how you can inform consumer habits, you can uh, inform employee habits. Uh, there's a range of data around uh, 
a, a particular company and the services or, or products that it's offer that it offers, and then also you have macro uh, data that can help uh, describe you know demographic trends. There, there's a there's a, a a huge amount of use for, for natural language processing and being able to distill data. I, I do want to point out though that you know there's um, this, I think it was just misunderstanding of how efficient our markets are and that um, actual public market pricing data still has a lot of alpha to be extracted from it spent with with uh, the AI um, neural networks in particular, because it's able to extract nonlinear features in data, which, you know, we're a majority of quantitative products outside of hedge funds and even even in hedge fund land, they're using uh, linear models and augmenting them rather than extracting true nonlinear information. So this is still uh, in, uh, I think we talked about toddler stage uh, in the morning session, but there's still a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of alpha to be extracted um, from market data. Um, and there's, and, and, and there's a, a, a a copious amount of market data, um, it, depending on what asset classes that you're trading. And so um, I think a combination of both can really, um, I guess, transform a lot of investment processes that maybe are aging because of the technology that they use, uh, the, the academic frameworks that they're still married to, and you know things like natural language processing and other unstructured data. Yeah, I think that's actually so true, right? Like, like the kind of the machine learning adoption overall, right? I mean, even just forget NLP, it's like it's in its infancy, right? Like we see this from potential users or clients all the time, right? Like, you know, I think most people, and, and we, we spoke about this earlier, I think it's fine to say, like, let me start with a linear kind of frame of mind, right? Like just to kind of just see what relationships are to what I would have expected them to be five, 10 years ago. Um, but uh, you know, I don't know if many are then like really going into a next step in the kind of reviewing uh, uh, more advanced machine learning techniques or nonlinear techniques. And uh, I mean, from my perspective, it's just a matter of time, right? Like this is going to happen um, within five years. And uh, to Julia's point, there is there's a lot still left on the table that they can model from. Uh, an alpha seeking perspective and you know I think the early adopters like Julia are just going to benefit from being first um, and applying these techniques in a rigorous fashion um, than the people that come later. Yeah I agree. So uh, uh, Brazad, I want to talk about ethics and regulation before I turn it over to you there's a question about ESG and I just want to make sure that at least uh, we're somewhat clear. I think the questioner makes a good point about surprise. It's not an alpha factor. And certainly when you're having global calls like this, uh, what uh, ESG broadly speaking or climate specifically means to an investor and an asset manager in uh, Denmark versus Korea versus the US can be very, very different things. And, and I, I still maintain ESG is, a, is a, an amalgamation of so many things and it's not a single risk factor. I think some are more measurable than the others. And if I just focus on the G, having a firm with good governance, that is an alpha factor full stop. So, uh, so I wanna make sure that uh, we, we did misstate that. I, I, I agree with the point more than disagree, but I don't wanna to spend too much more time in ESG since we're on uh, NLP, but it's an important topic. I wanna to make sure I made that point. Mm -hmm. uh, Razad, uh, on uh, uh, ethics and fiduciary responsibility and regulation, and when you're talking about topics like NLP, to think that uh, any global regulator is sitting back with a battery of data scientists that are one step ahead of the asset management side of the house is pure fallacy. They're, they're learning uh, and trying to catch up. And I think we as professionals have a responsibility to blaze this trail correctly. And we're capitalists at the end of the day and left our own devices. We wanna scrape every basis point we can possibly get about performance. But, uh, but I know that uh, certainly with the FDP credential with Kaya with CFA, ethics and fiduciary responsibilities are, are major underpinnings on this. And how much uh, of the work that you do uh, talking to our folks and webinars 
uh, we started to get a little bit uh, uh, too far ahead of ourselves with the, the, the asset management data side moving very, very quickly and regulation maybe becoming too much of a laggard. And that's a very good point. And, and I would say that the issues regarding fiduciary responsibility and regulatory and compliance are uh, the, on the top five issues that are brought up when we talk to the asset managers. So it is front and center. And I think um, NLP has a good chance of addressing something like that. For example, this morning we talked about one of the major banks um, that uh, has done some analysis, NLP analysis of all of their contracts, tens of thousands of contracts. And in real time, they did an analysis and they clustered the type of clauses that they need to pay attention for every transaction. And then that was put in front of their legal people. And as a result, they saved a lot of time. So I think uh, that part is a, is a very crucial piece of uh, 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 what asset managers and, and their concerns are. The other topic that we did talk about a little bit in the morning that I think I have still a concern is that most of the NLP, large NLP algorithms are pre-trained on a lot of data. And there is very little understanding of how much signal to noise ratio is there, how much bias is there and things like that. And what we build is things on top of that for the financial sector. So when you ask the question, who owns this data? Um, it begs the question that, you know, uh, that we need to address basically. And I don't think it's been addressed. No, I agree. And uh, I don't know why I'm sending a, a check into LinkedIn every month when they're using and reusing <laughs> my data. But uh, I don't know if you made that point as well. And that whole model may need to be shifted. So we just have a handful of minutes left, and I want to. Can I, can I touch upon one thing yeah, about uh, integrity in the uh, uh, as being you know very high in the FTP standards, and it should, um, you know, just for everyone to know, right? Like, even if you're on like the data side, right, um, or like even the data cleaning side, like which Alexander is on, like there are still many mistakes that can be made along the way. And it's very important to kind of try to treat these things from a very good place. Cause we've heard like the alternative data industry is still the wild west, right? Um, and a lot of times what can happen is like, I can build a model today and I can, you know, I have a lot of information at my hand of what the last three years of performance were, what year to date 2022 performance was, what, you know, uh, the financial crisis performance was. And so what I think some people can do if you're not operating from a place of integrity is to say, well, you know, let me, let me pick a lot of bad stories from 2009 and let me pick a lot of bad stories from the first three months of 2022 or the first six months of 2022. And that's how like, you know, I'm going to start having some sampling bias as I train my models because I know what's happening. You're sort of like, directing your model to predict the outcomes that you know have occurred. So it can be a very, very dangerous place. Um, and quite frankly, not every provider out there is a good actor. So um, like, you know, there is an economic incentive here for them to get clients and try to correct their models before they break down because they all break down eventually. Um, so, uh, you know, it's really, really important to try to do things the correct way uh, at the onset, you know, because these things will break. You know, if, if you try to bias your model, it's not going to work out for very long. And it's just a matter of time before it collapses. And so if you do it right, the right way from the start, you're going to save yourself a lot of pain in the future. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad you made the point, Dan, an important one. And for the listeners, uh, if you want a real-time case on this uh, Google app, Annie, uh, which did not use any kind of differential privacy, sold this data to the asset management industry. I don't even think they were regulated by the SEC. And when they put together their risk register, getting fined by the SEC was not uh, in their game theory. So, 
So whether you're regulated or not, if you're playing in the space, I think uh, Dan, you make an excellent point. So maybe moving toward uh, toward wrap up, I want to give each one of you a chance to make some closing observations. Uh, we didn't cover everything we wanted to, so you can either highlight something we missed or put uh, a, a big uh, hammer on something we did. Uh, so so with that, Julia, maybe I will start with you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just want to reinforce what uh, Dan is speaking of, model integrity. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, this is data. And data is flawed. It's dirty. You need, this is a good reason this micro badge will be great. Um, data science and the ability to analyze data and to understand how to properly um, curate it because the old phrase garbage in garbage out is is very true and um, using uh, any model whether you're using a classical linear regression model or you know if you're you are for foraying into advanced artificial intelligence um, you know you really do need to have um, a very sound scientific process in terms of understanding the problem you're trying to solve and using the right technology or algorithm to solve that problem. And that's independent of data. Data is a, is a whole other science, a whole other skill set. And, um, you know, the, the industry, it's good that the industry is, is slow to adopt because the reason that black boxes have a bad reputation is because when you don't understand how they work, you know, it's very difficult to understand the output. Um, and so, you know, there will be a wider adoption of this as everyone becomes more comfortable, but understanding why models can go wrong and how to, uh, you know, differentiate problems and output is, is really a really important skill. And um, it's the places where CAIA, CFA, and FDP Institute can really help um, people build the skill set outside of, you know, the university. Great. Thanks, Julia. Good observation. Dan, closing thoughts? Um, I mean, look, I, I just think it's exciting times to be in the data space, whether it be, you know, and not just from like a data producer as like I would be as even like a data consumer, um, uh, from just everything that's sort of been discussed, right? Like it's never been easier. So this is something we touched upon earlier, right? Like it's never been easier and cost effective to spin up something on the cloud and to test your ideas, right? Like what would have cost when we first started with Alexandria, I think we had to have like a server room. We put it in a closet, the thing overheated. We had to put an air conditioner in there, but all of that took like, you know, like a pretty upfront, a heavy upfront investment when you didn't necessarily have money at the time as a startup. Um, and now you can just spin something up very quickly. Um, you've got more computing power than you ever need. And the good thing is you can ratchet it up, ratchet it down um, as you need it, right? So the initial phase usually means a pretty heavy ratchet up ratchet up and then you can kind of scale down as necessary. Um, and there's all these systems that at least you can try, right? So one of the questions I guess came out earlier is like, you know, there's all these different systems and should you kind of use an existing system that might be open source? Should you build your own? Should you buy one, right? Um, but there's enough to get started um, uh, in even the open source land that you can start kind of testing your assumptions and see what you have before you have to move to the next step. So like it's, uh, it's, it's a very good place now, kind of more importantly, and I know I'm repeating myself and uh, kind of piggybacking on Julia, like, I guess the most important thing is like, you know, you can, these things are all powerful tools. So, you know, um, the goal is not to build like the best back test, because I've seen a bunch of interns that come into our offices trying to do that. Uh, the goal is to really kind of have a thoughtful analysis of data and, you know, always, um, uh, always second guess your results, right? Because uh, that'll be how you really understand if they're real or not. Okay, terrific. Thanks, Dan. Merzad, final word? Uh, I just want to second what uh, Dan and Julia mentioned in terms of the, the validity and importance of data itself. Having been in this industry for the past 20 years, um, I think we have done a good job in developing different models. And I think it's about time we put data as this data centric thinking in terms of the whole ecosystem of uh, data science. So 
just don't look at data as the as the thing you clean and you give it to the model, but iterate, keep iterating, keep cleaning data and keep putting it through the system. I think that's a key, at least for NLP and alternative data these days. So that would be my final uh, suggestion to the to the uh, audience. Terrific. Well, uh, thanks, Mirzad, and uh, thank you, Julia and Dan. Times two, uh, we started the day together and ended it quite late here in the Northeast in the United States, but uh, great to have some airtime with our folks in uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, there's a lot more information at fdpinstitute.org. Uh, Kai is very involved in this space and to give the CFA uh, their due as well. They've been very active and wandering into the space as well. And our goal is to give the end investor the tools they need to be successful because products are getting more and more democratized. Access is getting more democratized. And we've got to make sure we keep the, uh, that playing field uh, level. So with that, uh, uh, thank you again. And uh, Kim, were you going to close us out? I will close us out. Just a quick thank you to everyone. And if you've enjoyed tonight's webinar, we do encourage you to join us on August 30th at 11 a.m. Eastern time, where Dr. Keith Black is going to be speaking with Michelle Noyes of AMA and Michael Ide of Alborn Partners. And they'll be discussing and understanding the landscape of quantitative investing. So please keep in touch with us. Join us for the webinars and provide your suggestions on alternative topics that you might be interested in learning more about.